Kristen, go right ahead. Thank you, Susan. Welcome, everyone. Um, as Susan mentioned, I'm Kristen Lays. I work here at Heritage Preservation, and we're very glad that you've joined us today. Looks like a lot of you have been on our previous webinars and live chats, and we appreciate you joining us again. We are recording this today, so I just want to give our little description so that um, others who might be listening to the recording later um, understand what this is about. But Heritage Preservation is moderating the Connecting to Collections online community in cooperation with the American Association for State and Local History and with funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. We are very grateful to Learning Times for helping us design our, our online community site and for producing these live chats. And what we're doing with this online community is hopefully building a network of museums, libraries, archives, and historical societies, especially those that are smaller and don't have a conservator on staff, and creating a place online where they can get reliable preservation information and can network with their colleagues. And um, this last week in particular, it's been really great to see our discussions being so active on the site. We have developed this community um, as a, another outreach after the Connecting to Collections Initiative bookshelf and Raising the Bar workshop and webinars and other um, seminars and workshops that we've done around the country. And so it's also a place where we've had all those recordings archived and, um, again, just a ready resource for everyone. We are up to almost 1,500 members on the online community, and that's just great. So about twice a month, we do these webinars. And um, at the end of today's session, I will talk about some that are upcoming. Um, today, um, we're going to be talking about the care of plastics. And on the online community, you'll see a link to our resource that we're featuring. And um, we have two great speakers with us today. Christine Fronart, a conservative contemporary art and modern materials. Um, in New York City, and Odile Madden, who is a research scientist at the Museum Conservation Institute at the Smithsonian Institution. And um, they have a lot of great information for you today. But I just want to remind everybody that um, if you do have questions that go beyond what we're able to cover in today's webinar, um, just know about the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works. And on their website, they have this Find a Conservator link. And that's a place that you can search by type of material and geographic location to find someone in your area that could help you with uh, more specific issues. So um, before we get going, I just want to learn a little bit more about our audience today. If you don't mind answering a few poll questions, it'll help sort of set the stage for what we're trying to learn. Um, would you mind just typing in what institution you're joining us for, like a museum, um, library, archive, historical society, historic site? We, I think um, we've done this as a multiple choice closed-ended question, and there's just such a variety that it's sometimes nice to see just an open-ended response. We're seeing some nice diversity here. few more minutes to make sure everybody has a chance to reply. We've got about 50 people so far on the chat today. Okay. Um, we've got another open-ended question. Um, if you could just sort of describe what types of artifacts you have in your collection that are made of plastics. Um, you may have a large variety. So if, if you prefer, you can, you can also answer the question in terms of what are the plastic objects in your collection that you're most worried about, about what brought you here today. OK, 
again, it looks like a great variety Lots of household items. And we heard about Diane Vole and her vintage traffic cones, hard hats, and things used by road designers and construction workers, very unique collection. Okay, we'll just give this a few more minutes. Okay, uh, next is a close-ended poll question. All right, it looks like um, uh, Christina and Odile have their work cut out for them in terms of giving you some tips on storage. And finally, want to see what types of preventive measures you are engaged in in terms of, excuse me, let me just resize this box. And so how do you inspect your plastic materials for degradation. All right. Well, we'll have some tips for you today for sure. OK. Well, I just wanted to let you know I, there's some talk about not hearing voice talking, and I uh, was just uh, getting um, everyone a chance to, to to fill in these poll questions, and I was being quiet. So, apologize if I have made you concerned about your audio, but we are off and running now. I'm going to go ahead and close these polls, and um, we um, will go ahead with uh, Christine and Nodil's presentation. Um, and while I bring that up, I'll just invite them to say hello and tell us a little bit more about themselves. Hi, this is Odile Madden. I'm a research scientist at the Smithsonian's Museum Conservation Institute. Uh, and I want to say thanks to Heritage Preservation for having us here today to speak to you about plastic. Um, I am a research scientist who was originally trained as an objects conservator, so I have familiarity with the issues of people working with collections space. Um, and I am the head of the Modern Materials Research Group at MCI. So we tend to focus on plastics, but we also look at other materials, um, metal, high-tech metal, metal alloys, uh, nano stuff, uh, and the like. But I like to focus on plastics because I think they're our biggest conservation challenge. Hi, and this is Christina Frunas. I'm a conservator for contemporary art, modern materials, and media. And I'm just in the process of founding a, a company with a dear colleague, um, Beck and Frunat, entirely focusing on contemporary art and modern materials and media. And I'm a traditionally trained paintings and sculpture conservator, joined the Museum Ludwig in Cologne in 1993, and became head of conservation of the department in 2000. And we were looking at the media collection in the museum, which houses a large film and video collection, as well as the plastics um, collection. And this is when a program became available in Bern, Switzerland. So I went there and graduated from there, too. And ever since, um, both media and um, modern materials are my passion. 
Well, great. Thank you, and, and welcome again. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. I'll turn it over to you to start your PowerPoint, and then um, we'll answer questions as we have um, time to in the middle of your presentation. But everyone, feel free to ask questions in the chat, and I will look for those, and we will make sure they get answered, if not right away, at some point during our hour together. Great. Well, this is Odile, um, and I'm going to start the presentation, and Christina is going to do the second half. Uh, we're calling this the care of plastics. Uh, and we're going to be talking about plastics in collections and discussing considerations in caring for them. This is going to be fairly broad and general, as we have limited time today. And we want to make uh, lots of time for you guys to ask, uh, ask your questions. So I think it's always useful to have an idea of where we're going. Uh, so here's the plan of what we're going to follow. We're going to try to stick to. Uh, first, we're going to be defining plastics, what we mean by them. So we're all talking about the same thing. We're going to cover how we identify and characterize them and how you might as well. We're going to discuss signs of deterioration, what that deterioration looks like or smells like. Then uh, we're going to talk about the causes of deterioration, and this is going to be fairly cursory. And then we're going to be making some recommendations for monitoring, storage, exhibit, cleaning, repair, et cetera. And we're going to stick, uh, try to stick roughly to this outline. You'll see some of that information gets uh, interspersed in. We'll be talking, so some recommendations might come up much earlier than, uh, than in their place in the presentation. So let's talk first about what plastics are. What do we mean by them? I like to call them polymer composites. Uh, plastics are a broad, refers to a broad category of materials, the fundamental unit of which is called a polymer. Uh, and these polymers tend to be mixed with uh, plasticizers, colorants, or pacifiers, fillers and bulking agents, fire retardants, UV stabilizers, and other materials that either modify the way the material is processed, so the way the polymer is, say, cast into a film, uh, or ways something that will modify the performance of the polymer, so making it, say, flexible uh, as opposed to rigid. And so it's a com plastics or a common name for polymer composite materials, as I just said. The fundamental component is a polymer. And a polymer is a long chain molecule. It usually has a carbon backbone, sometimes silicon. And I'm going to show you a picture of a really straightforward polymer, polyethylene. Uh, the gray balls are carbon atoms, and the white balls are hydrogen atoms. And I promise this is very interesting and will be mercifully brief. Um, but these are well, each one of these three chains is what we would call a polymer. It's a molecule that can have carbons from a number of carbons ranging from thousands to hundreds of thousands in length. The material properties of the polymer, what makes a plastic have certain properties, uh, depends on the kinds of the atoms present and how they're arranged. I'm going to show you two other examples. The one at the top is polyethylene terephthalate, which we call PET. It's the main component in your soda bottles. Uh, and you can see that it's got the gray carbon, the white hydrogen, and it's got some red oxygen atoms as well. And you can see that it has there are lengths of this carbon there are lengths of carbon, but it's interspersed with oxygen, and there are rings. That's going to affect how that material behaves. Um, for one thing, making it react differently to water than, say, polyethylene would. Uh, then below that is cellulose. And cellulose is a natural polymer. Um, it's, a com it's a structural polymer found in all plant materials, so in wood and linen. Um, it's really what makes your paper fibers, your cotton fibers. And you can see that it's a really elegant structure made by nature. Uh, beautiful five-membered uh, five carbon ring with an oxygen in there. Uh, and this natural polymer, you all are familiar with it from working with paper. Uh, when we talk about semi-synthetic plastics, you'll hear a lot about the true synthetics and the semi-synthetics. The semi-synthetics, I want to point out, tend to refer to um, these natural polymers that have been modified. The carbon backbone already exists. And the end groups are modified. So hold on, I'm going to try to pull up a pointer here. This webinar technology is amazing. This is our, chain, our polymer backbone, and these are our side groups, right? So when you've got cellulose nitrate or cellulose acetate uh, plastics, what's happening is that these end groups are being replaced out. 
OHs are being replaced out with nitrate groups or acetate groups, and that really changes how the material behaves. All of a sudden, something like paper can be dissolved in a solvent like acetone, or it can be heated and made to flow, and those are things that do not happen with paper. Make the pointer go away. No. On. There we go. So polymers are just polymers. When I say a plastic is a polymer composite, that's really important to remember because polymers on their own are often not useful, right? So they tend to be mixed with smaller molecules that will change the properties of the final plastic material. And let me give you some examples of what those might be. Up. Oh, I'm going to give you some right now, and then we'll see a couple in a in another minute. Um, those modify the molecules might be colorants. Uh, they could be something that makes the material opaque rather than transparent. They might be decorative. Uh, the molecules called plasticizers are also ones that affect the flow of your polymer. So your polymer might not be able to be melted at a temperature of, say, of the processing equipment that a factory has. But if you add a plasticizer molecule, these little molecules act sort of like ball bearings between the polymer chains and allow slip to happen more easily so the polymer can be melted at a lower temperature. So how do we go about identifying and characterizing these uh, plastics? I'm at the Smithsonian, and I like being there because I have this suite of analytical instrumentation. So we use, uh, I tend to rely on non-destructive non-sampling technologies like Raman spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy, X-ray fluorescence spectroscopies, and those will tell us what molecules we've got and uh, what elements are present. Then there's also GCMS, gas chromatography mass spec, which requires a sample to be removed, but it can be very useful analytically. But not everyone has that instrumentation. I mean, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to maintain a lab like that. So most of the time, we're looking at plastics for visual cues. Uh, the most obvious is the resin codes that are on the underside of many plastic objects, many containers. So when you see the, the triangle with the arrows that says PP for polypropylene or HDPE for high-density polyethylene, those give you the idea of the polymer that's there. Right. They don't tell you what additives are there. And they're there for helping to sort recycling. Uh, they're not there for us working in the preservation field. Uh, but they can be helpful. Then the look of a material. Uh, what does the plastic look like? With time, you might get used to um, recognizing what, say, polypropylene looks like. Uh, and we, can't, we don't have the time to, or the resources to be able to show you that today. That really comes with experience. But I'd say that it's not just about identifying what polymer you've got. Um, the plastic, as I said, it's a polymer plus additives. It's then it's processed into a form. So you want to know, have you got a clear film? Do you have a foam? Do you have a solid block of uh, plastic? Uh, do you have a coating? Do you have a fiber? Uh, those are visual cues that are very important to record and will consider how you go about caring about something. Um, smell, for those of you who deal with uh, some of the smellier plastics, like cellulose acetate, smells like vinegar. Um, rubber has a very characteristic smell. Uh, so you can smell the artifact itself, or you, there are also melt-burn tests, which I don't advocate for uh, melting artifacts and doing such a destructive test. But if you have the opportunity to make one make some smoke, <laughs> you try to give it a quick whiff and see if you can recognize it. The density of plastics will help tell you um, some float and some don't float, say, in water. Uh, if you have that opportunity, you could look at it. But basically, density means uh, the weight of the object compared to how big it is. Uh, and then the solubility. So they're the thermoplastic polymers that tend to be soluble in some range of organic solvents. And then there are the thermoset plastics, which tend not to be soluble. So sometimes that can help you uh, narrow down what you're working with. So let's have just some looks. This is a, we're going to see this object a couple times. This is a, something called Lumerith. It was a brand of cellulose acetate made by the Celluloid Corporation, which then became Selenese Corporation. And it was a plastic that um, replaced cellulose nitrate. Uh, and cellulose acetate was really popular because it could be injection molded and also because it could be made in amazing colors. So what we have here in the middle is a salesman's kit of coupons. So these are square coupons. You see one in the upper right. And these would have been brought to a customer to say, hey, you want to make eyeglass frames? Look what you can make eyeglass frames look like. And the properties that you might 
to some quick properties, you'd see that there are colorants that have been added. So you're looking at the color of an object will give you some idea of what's in it. Uh, the opacifier, some of these are transparent, some of those are opaque. So you'd say, OK, there's something in there that's making it opaque. Glitter is even in one. It's actually in this one right here. It's pretty fabulous. It's like a ruby red with glitter. And plasticizers. This is important for under, um, to deal with a, a step in learning to deal with plastics is understanding the technology by which they're made. And that takes time, right? So I happen to know, working with cellulose acetate, an awful lot that it cannot be injection molded and made to flow for any purpose without a plasticizer being added. So I know to look for it. And commonly, that plasticizer is diethyl phthalate or dimethyl phthalate. And you often see triphenyl phosphate as well. But that's something I now know through years of experience. So Christina is going to talk about the causes of deterioration. But I'm going to, since I'm going to be showing you some deterioration, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of there are causes that are external to the artifact, such as mechanical damage, dinging it, uh, temperature, humidity, light, pollutants, and biological organisms. And then there are internal causes of deterioration, which sometimes conservators refer to as inherent vice. And that can be caused by chemical instability. So the polymer is just inherently unstable. Uh, incompatibility of components. Sometimes that plasticizer isn't well matched to that polymer. Or as the polymer ages, the plasticizer does, isn't a good fit anymore, and it tends to migrate out. Uh, there can be contaminants from the manufacturing process. And there can be defects in internal stresses, which comes from processing. So let's say you injection mold a plastic, which means that you take a molding powder of the plastic, you heat it up, it flows, you squirt it into a mold, you cool down that mold, and out comes your object. Right. Um, internal stresses can be set up when that polymer hasn't had enough time to relax. Uh, and those can cause problems over time. They can be, uh, they can cause yeah, sort of explosive breakage. They can cause chemical reactions to happen uh, more in that location. Because that point uh, where there's stress, there's higher energy. It's more likely to do stuff. Uh, what are signs of deterioration in plastics? Uh, I divide them into those that are visible, smell, have to do with weight, mechanical changes, and unseen chemical changes. Um, mechanical changes and unseen chemical changes, you're not going to see so much. You might see a mechanical, feel a mechanical change, say, for a film that just doesn't feel as flexible anymore, something that feels brittle. Uh, so let's go through some examples. Discoloration. These are two spray bottles that belong to my hairdresser, Joanne, in Los Angeles. <laughs> he's a good friend of mine. And after 10 years of going to him, he's had this plastic duck, the one on the left. And over time, it started out as all one color. But it's made of a bunch of different plastic materials, right? There's, that, there's the head, and then there's the body, and then there's this uh, water uh, plug, and then there's this squirt, uh, squirt bottle attachment and then there's a white neck. Over time, these have become different colors. And we suspect that light's the color, light, light exposure is the culprit. Uh, you can see this one is newer. And already, it's got differences as well. So this is easier to notice when you've got a plastic object with multiple pieces on it. Or you might be able to see differential exposure, like um, if you had something that the top side might be more faded than the underside, right? But sometimes it can be a little difficult uh, to keep track of if an object's fading overall, in which case monitoring is really useful because you want to have an idea. You'll forget over time what color the thing was. So you want to record it. Oops. There we go. So other visible signs of degradation, looking at the Lumerith coupons. Here we had, there were 46 of these coupons. They belong to the National Museum of, the Amer of American History, which is the Smithsonian Museum in Washington. These coupons are cellulose acetate. They all should have been breaking down. But we found instead that 46 were in good condition, and three were severely deteriorated. And cellulose acetate is a notoriously unstable plastic. But we were, you know, we were interested that only three were showing the severe deterioration. And without going into the cause, I will show you some of the characteristics. First thing we saw was liquid plasticizer, which is diethyl phthalate, exuding from the cellulose acetate. So you can see the arrow pointing to those little droplets of liquid. Uh, and it's actually moving as a front that moves out across the stable object and is followed by cracking. You can also see that brown discoloration up in the worst, uh, in the most degraded areas. 
the diethyl, loss of diethyl phthalate, triphenyl phosphate, and acetic acid. And those are all things we figured out, except for the acetic acid. We figured out all those things instrumentally, so that's not something you'd be expected to be able to see in a chemical. But if you know what the, if you understand cellulose acetate technology and you understand something about how it falls apart, which you learn with experience, you'll have an idea of what those compounds are. But we've got, what happens is the plasticizers and acetic acid are lost, and that means the material shrinks. Right? And shrinking can be manifested as distortion, the formation of a waste, so this would have had flat sides originally, and eventually cracking as the material tries to accommodate that loss of, uh, loss of its uh, bulk. Another sign, another uh, instance of distortion here, this is something from the resin kit, which some of you might be familiar with, it's a reference sample, their reference samples of plastics provided to industry. Uh, you can see here, I love this pointer, you can see here, this would have been originally in plain, but with time with the loss of plasticizer, it's distorting. Smell is a good indicator for deterioration, and certainly we don't advocate that you go sniffing noxious chemical compounds, but when you're working with plastics, often the smell is obvious. So the smells are, that are emitted by artifacts will, are signs of deterioration often. Uh, so smelly plastic and rubber may indicate loss of volatile acids, plasticizers, or other substances. So that shrinkage phenomenon is happening, even if you can't see it yet. Um, big examples are acid, uh, plastics that evolve acids might smell like vinegar or vomit. Those would be uh, indi indicative of cellulose acetate, which gives off acetic acid, which is vinegar. Or vomit is often cellulose acetate butyrate. Butyric acid smells like vomit. Uh, camphor could indicate cellulose nitrate. So you know, use your nose. Uh, pay attention to the smells in your storage areas. And here, weight loss is another one. It's very simple. When you're doing monitoring, weigh your objects, uh, especially if they're a solid thing that's not shedding components. Uh, these are the Lumerith coupons, the 49 coupons. You can see that this shows a graph of the y-axis is their weight, and the x-axis is their uh, the number of the coupon. And you can see that these 46 all weigh about the same, right? And the three deteriorated ones weigh 20 to 30 percent less. And that goes a long way to explaining why that cracking is happening. And with that, I will turn it over to Christina. Thank you, Odile. Yes, as uh, Odile already mentioned, there are various influencing factors as shown in this graph that are responsible for the degradation of polymers. It is hard to focus the reactions because the different degradation agents interact in practice. And in addition, in most of the cases, no information is available about the possible irregular constitutions of the molecules. Another widely unknown factor is the blend or compound or impurities and additives. So this is resulting in visible change of the material like discoloration, change of dimensions, embrittlement, crumbling, loss of surface gloss, and mechanical properties. Under more extreme conditions, the release of volatile products can be found on the surface. Now I have to find my yes, arrow. So let's look um, at more um, damage phenomena in more detail. Here are um, some uh, examples of um, degradation phenomena found uh, while conducting a monitoring at the museum Ludwig in Cologne in Germany. And to the left, you see a well-known damage uh, for um, TMMA, or better known as um, sexy, which is crazing. And crazing occurs as a network of microfissures that are apparent fissures are internally bridged by a polymer material of lower density. And it can be um, found due to internal or external stress, chemical agents, or loss of plasticizer. And you can often find it in cellulose nitrate and TMMA. And a su surprising example was uh, seen on the right. And this is the um, glazing of a frame that was affected by uh, powder puff pieces. And as you can see, uh, the insects uh, weren't stopped by the plexi glazing to find their way out of the framing. I initially couldn't believe my eyes when I, when I saw it, but it is widely known that um, plastics can be attacked by uh, microorganisms and uh, macroorganisms, and it's, it's, it's 
seen within polyethylene, polycarbonate, um, PMMA, PVC, polyurethane. Um, <clears throat> liquid deposits on polymers have been um, found on the surface of this artwork. And this is usually due to the migration of the plasticizer, um, degradation pod products, or um, lubricant deposits. If you encounter it, if you see liquid deposits on artworks, don't touch them. But as uh, Odile already um, mentioned, check the odor. It might point you to the polymer that you're looking at. It can be found within uh, cellulose, nitrate, cellulose acetate, PVC, and polyurethane. This is, of course, an <laughs> extreme example and shows how an uh, um, artwork made out of polyester by Duane Hansen was severely damaged by a visitor through a very, very strong mechanical interaction. It was basically a schoolboy running into it. And um, well, even uh, <clears throat> the impact was that hard that even the, um, um, the, the way it was secured to the wall was pulled out of the wall and uh, resulted in this severe break of, of um, the arm. Um, crumbling is um, an active degradation of a polymer resulting into um, microfragments. And so it's often triggered by the influence of oxygen and o ozone, as well as um, well higher temperatures and the exposure to light which results into um, the scissions of the uh, chain scissions, um, as seen to the right, um, polyurethane, and which is the most prominent polymer that uh, shows this kind of um, um, degradation. Um, monitoring of your plastic, um, plastic collection is a powerful tool to determine the condition and the needs of the object in your collection. And in order to plan a project like that, you uh, wanted to uh, specify and uh, determine the scope of your examination of your object. Um, it is always helpful to um, conduct a pilot survey or pilot monitoring to identify the variety of your objects in your collection and also to quantify the project. Once you have you, the results from your um, pilot survey, you can analyze it and modify your survey and design a data sheet that is um, that is fitting your needs in, in your collection. And then you can collect the data, which then can be analyzed, and um, the results being represented. Um, it is probably good to have um, an outline of um, guiding questions that can help you to define the scope of the project, and which can be in which condition are the artworks made of synthetic organic polymers in your collection? What is the kind and extent of damages? Uh, is there any danger caused by storage criteria or immediate environment? Are there any particular works that need to be separated from others and stored in isolation, like degraded cellulose nitrate, cellulose acetate, PVC, or polyurethane. Are there any further preventive steps necessary, um, um, for example, storage in closed containers involving indicators and or oxygen absorbers? Are there objects which cannot be exhibited anymore due to the material degradation and contraposition to the artist's intent? How can changes in condition be examined and monitored on a long view? Well, uh, to do this, it helps to develop <laughs> a, a data sheet. And I apologize for this um, uh, sheet that is actually in German because it was developed for the monitoring in the Museum Ludwig. But I'm going to walk you through um, to um, each component just to outline what we found um, um, important to include within the sheet, which is basically the identification uh, of the artwork and um, the description of the plastic. We chose to implement more columns because in um, some artworks of modern and contemporary art, you will see different plastics within um, one artwork, and we wanted to be able to include it in there. Then we have um, this, um, a line to describe the storage, um, the way it's, it's 
store it in your storage location and describe the environment. And then there's basically a list of different damage phenomena that are being quantified within this list. And on top of it is um, a cell for the odor, based on the fact that when you monitor your collection and you open a crate, this is the first thing you recognize. So therefore, you wanted to put it at the top of, of your list. And then once um, every um, plastic is, is uh, monitored and any um, uh, degradation phenomena is quantified, it will translate into the overall condition of um, your artwork. Um, the results of um, the monitoring, which was kind of small because we started with um, works in the um, collection of um, uh, paintings uh, and, and sculptures and then extended it to the media collection of film and video, were um, 68 um, uh, objects. And um, most of them have been in a fair or good um, condition, but the 20 artworks showed up in the poor um, condition resulting into um, conservation actions. And uh, um, unfortunately, in seven cases, we found um, unacceptable conditions. So the damages that had been found ranged from extreme surface dirt, visually interacting with the polymer, as well as ex extensive grazing, cracks, fracture, or active degradation like crumbling and embrittlement. Um, the results that um, were taken from this monitoring were um, well translated nicely into a deeper analysis of what are the main problems in the collection, what are the main um, factors of degradation. And when you look at the damage phenomena listed here, and I hope you can read it, um, the main problems accounted were like surface dirt, um, staining, um, solid dirt. Most of it was um, uh, externally, and most of it was easy to avoid with all these um, detailed information um, now being available. So um, I strongly believe in monitoring. <laughs> and um, the advantage of it is, is once a, a system is developed, it is actually not that time consuming. Um, you, most of the time is spent to to develop a form, although there are more and more forms um, um, available. And a recent one has been published in uh, the recent pop art or publication. And so you can adapt it to your needs. And it will provide you with a very thorough, thorough knowledge of your um, collection's condition that can be translated into preventive conservation and treatment. It would also. Um, um, apply to the education of your eye. Over the time uh, when you look at more and more degradation phenomena, you really learn a lot about it and know what to watch out for. It is a powerful tool of uh, collection management, which um, also translates into um, yeah, your collection needs that then be translated into your budget planning on a um, short and midterm and long-term view. So um, I highly recommend, and I saw at the very beginning that uh, I think 77% of you don't do monitoring on a, a regular basis. So I would like to encourage you um, um, to do so. And I wanted to wrap up here with an image showing uh, uh, the drama by Maurizio Catalan. And you can only imagine what it will take to preserve an artwork made out of plastics exposed to the elements. Thank you. And I guess we are now opening for questions. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Christine and Odile. Um, I had a few questions um, that came to mind. And I hope that others will will put in um, their questions in the chat box. But um, I did notice that Dee had, had noticed one of her objects had actually liquefied. And so what she's done is stored it in um, in a freezer storage. Is that something you would recommend if, if it's observed that there's a severe degradation? 
I yeah. can try, Christine, I don't know what you think, but I'll go, f maybe, I'm not sure if we agree on all this, but I would say that most, there's a general rule for keeping plastic, let's see, conditions for preserving plastic, often they favor other artifacts as well, so if you can keep it cool, keep it relatively dry, not humid, um, and not totally dry, so I don't know, 30 to 50 percent would be really rough as a guideline, but keep it dark, you don't want, eliminate UV, um, that will, favor preservation of most materials. When you start going to extremes, I'd start questioning first what phenomenon, what mechanism are you tr of deterioration are you trying to stop? So freezing, we use it to kill bugs because we know bugs don't like the cold. Um, but with the freezing, with cellulose nitrate, it's generally, I believe, to slow the rate of reaction. So you're trying to slow acid hydrolysis of um, removal of nitrate groups from your cellulose or acetate groups from your cellulose. With the liquefying, I can see a couple things happening. Either maybe a polyurethane that's liquefying by a chemical reaction, or it could be plasticizer leaching out. And there's some debate that keeping your plastic very cold keeps it more rigid, and that could actually squeeze out more plasticizer. So I, my answer would be that I don't know, and I think there still is and should be a fair amount of debate. I agree with you, um, Odile, and um, I generally speaking, um, well, my advice would be to keep it um, um, cooler and uh, keep the humidity um, to a lower degree. But um, what is recommended for media collection, and uh, those of you who hold um, film and video in your collections, that it's definitely advisable to keep it in a cold storage. Yes, and we did actually, uh, one of our first webinars was about cold storage of film-based materials. So that's available on um, Connecting the Collections online um, community um, under care of photographs. So we can point people to that. Um, I, would add that I would add that for dealing with photographic materials and motion picture materials and electronic media, a lot of research has been done by industry. Uh, so motion picture industry, the people who are making the tape, Eastman Kodak, the Image Permanence Institute, they've done a lot of research and they know they've got a limited set of variables. You know, they know what materials they're dealing with. They come from manufacturers uh, with a long history of knowledge of the chemistry. So they're more able to make sweeping generalizations about what to do with that kind of material, depending on what your object is. Like I keep seeing traffic cones coming up on the screen here. <laughs> um, obviously, you wouldn't put a traffic cone in your typical freezer. But those materials or artist materials are not going to necessarily fall under the same, uh, wouldn't fall under the same recommendations necessarily as film preservation. So just keep it in mind that your object could be very different from the object that's being described in the guideline. OK. Now, a couple of people have been asking about um, keeping plastics in isolation. And you mentioned separating um, artifacts by the type of plastic they may be made out of. Can you talk a little more about how you, how you should isolate plastic artifacts and um, what types of materials could be used to isolate? Um, or type of storage containers, I should say, would be used? Mm -hmm. um, well, you certainly want to identify any um, cellulose nitrate or cellulose acetate in uh, your collection because um, during its process of degradation, uh, it can, um, it will <laughs> release autocatalytic um, uh, gases that uh, in turn will affect the surrounding area um, within your collection. Um, so maybe um, Odile can talk a little bit more on that because she is um, faced with a lot of cellulose acetate, which we didn't encounter at the um, um, Museum Ludwig during the um, monitoring. But um, we uh, were confronted with um, also a combination of plastics and uh, under uh, and other uh, ephemeral like um, food and had to make sure that um, those works uh, are not um, attacked by bugs. And um, what has been done is um, um, they were sealed in Eskyl foil, which is um, a ceramic coated um, polyethylene. And then we reduced the oxygen content with um, ageless in those, in those um, containers. And in many, many, many cases, just Building a nice, dust-free environment for your three-dimensional objects 
in um, in the storage really helps a lot. <laughs> Um, I would agree with Christina. The with the types of plastics that typically one would recommend isolating, they tend to be cellulose nitrate, cellulose acetate, uh, PVC, polyurethane, and rubber. Um, there are two sets of reasons for this: the acetate, the nitrate, and the PVC can evolve acids into the air, and those acids, once they're in the air, they can go travel to some other object that might be sensitive to acids. So there's the concern that, say, cellulose acetate is what I happen to work with a lot right now. Um, if you've got a bunch of vinegar smell in your storage, uh, you might, and you've got some metals there too, say brass or copper alloys, that metal is going to be susceptible to corroding by that acetic acid. So I would get my vulnerable plastics away from my metal collections. Um, there's some debate of whether or not to store all the cellulose acetate together. I would say that maybe creates a nice concent heavy, a high concentration of acetic acid that could dam damage your plastic. But um, I'd certainly say there's, I don't think there's any contention about uh, separating it from metals that could corrode. Another thing I've seen is with polyvinyl chloride especially, it's heavily plasticized, right? That's a lot of what, when I'm reading in the questions and comments about things getting sticky, often you've got that plasticizer migrating out, right? And it's a liquid. So what, con what surface you put in contact with that plasticized material is an issue. So you might want to isolate PVC, uh, flexible PVC objects or flexible plastics in general. Keep them off of varnished shelves. Uh, for anyone who works in like a historic house, keep them off of painted shelves because that plasticizer can migrate. Uh, just like acids can go through the air and plasticizers can go through the air a little bit, they migrate really well when you put something in contact, especially something porous. And you'll see that, um, I don't know if any of you have used this. I use it on boats a lot and I've seen collections that use it. It's a mesh that's been flocked with PVC, so it's kind of a non-slip mesh. That's a plasticized PVC, and I've seen that dissolve the surface off of historic furniture. So um, keep in mind when you're dealing with flexible stuff that you might not want it, uh, flexible plastic, you might not want it in contact with varnished or painted surfaces. And so when you, so basically, uh, um, to, to sum up, it sounds like if you can smell it, it's not a good sign, and you should isolate it from other collections items. And would you put that in some type of an acid-free box, something that has some airflow in it, as opposed to, say, a plastic box or other enclosed uh, it, metal sh cabinetry it's or anything an like issue. that? Yeah, I'd say put it in a different room, but OK. <laughs> not everyone has an isolated room. Uh, but the there's a, OK, so. There's a debate in this too whether to vent some, whether to store something in a closed air environment or to exchange the air. Uh, if you've got acids coming off of cellulose acetate, say, or acids coming off of PVC, at the same time you've also got plasticizers leaving. And the plasticizers, you would like to keep them in place. Every time you take them out of the air, a little more is going to want to migrate out into the air. So you run the risk of having a shrinkage problem. At the same time, you don't want high concentrations of acid building in your in a storage environment, uh, say a small container, because that can then cause degradation of your polymer. So there's some re interesting research being done right now in with acid scavengers, something that in a closed environment one could expect a scavenger to interact with the acid. So the acid is taken out of the air selectively, and then the plasticizer stays put. But as of now, there I don't think that there's a good answer. Um, it seems to be a bit of a let taste great, less filling debate about vent it, don't vent it, vent it, don't vent it. But I really don't think we have the answer. OK, so that's that just brings us all back to monitoring, um, separating it from the rest of the collection and monitoring it carefully, and maybe getting some specific advice on um, highly highly degrading collections from a conservator who could do more research on the specific type of material it is. Mm -hmm. I would agree right? on that. OK. <laughs> Since I mean, the needs for the um, specific artwork might be so special and it's hard to, to uh, say it in general. And it also it might be designed specifically due to well the facility where, where it's housed to. I, I think it's, um, it always has to be an individual Right. So, and um, someone has asked about, you know, 
products that were made from the 1980s and beyond when things became even, it's, you know, plastics are even becoming more and more and more complex. Um, are there any sort of general recommendations on the care of more recent plastic materials as opposed to those made earlier in the 20th century? Or is it all these same sort of um, recommendations apply? Um, I, this is Odile, I um, am at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, which is one of the Smithsonian museums this week, so I'm actually in uh, New York. And they've got a lot of stuff in their collections from the 1980s. And what I've noticed is, I, mean, I tend to look at plastics that are more from the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, you just, we don't necessarily see more complex formulations happening, but we see different materials being used. So instead of cellulose acetate for injection molded objects, you see a lot of more ABS, acrylonitrile, butadiene, styrene. Um, and it's got its own uh, fillers, often like white pigment. But beyond that, it's not necessarily more complicated. I think the same storage recommendations hold true and that you want to keep it reasonably on the cooler side, um, but not too cold, uh, not humid, not totally dry, so maybe in the 30 to 50 percent range. Um, and consider having the most important thing probably being out of all of that, probably being removing, reducing the dust. Um, and I should point out the dust, see these questions, these questions are hard because we don't really have necessarily have good answers. But um, in addition to the environmental conditions you can control through the building, Christina's mentioned a couple times that you should be limiting dust. Imagine if your surface is getting sticky on an object and you've got dust building up on it. How are you going to clean that off? Dust is also very abrasive. It tends to hold moisture on an object. So you want to keep your object as clean as possible so you don't have to clean it, run the risk of abrasion. You don't want to leave dust there that can react. Um, and also be unsightly and difficult to remove. And I realize that probably didn't answer your question very well. <laughs> Sorry. I, I would like to add that when I think of um, plastics from the 80s and the 90s that show problems, I, well, I immediately start thinking about um, plastics that have been fabricated by the artists or pushed to their limits. And uh, I've seen a lot of um, mechanical damage due to the fact that um, the polymer was um, used in a different way to hold more weight or has been redesigned into a table, into a frame, and was taken away from its original um, purpose um, to fit into the uh, artistic needs. And um, those uh, processes have resulted in, in mechanical stress and, and, and cracks have seen that a lot. That's a good point. And I, I know I've heard from others that it's very important, especially if you have the ability to talk to a living artist, mm -hmm. to learn as much as possible about their fabrication process and what they used and how they used it, um, and to get as much information from an artist when you accession a contemporary art object as possible so that this information would be available to researchers and to conservators later on in its life if it does experience that kind of problem. Um, we had a question about how one should um, put a session labeling or, or other labeling on plastic objects. This is probably not a situation where we want to label the object directly um, like it's possible to do with some other types of material. Um, and so uh, one institution has been trying to encourage ta using tags, but even would even the twine or you know, gentle string on a tag be a problem on some of these plastic artifacts? They're certainly linty. Um, I, I see that it's, really, it's a problem. It's a challenge to get an accession number onto plastic objects, in part because you don't know what the plastic is. You don't know what the polymer is. You don't know what the formulation is. So I would avoid going for any kind of barrier coat and labeling system, nothing with a solvent, nothing that's going to involve an eraser either. Um, but the, the tags, paper tags with a string, I do see those used. Um, I see those here in the Cooper Hewitt collection, actually. And they're not necessarily tied to the object. So if an object is small and in a tray, sometimes the label is in the tray. And then it falls to having careful collections management to make sure it doesn't get separated. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe tie the tag to a non-plastic component. 
Okay, Christina. That's a good yeah, I agree. I would keep the um, I would keep the tag close <laughs> to the artwork, either within uh, his storage box or right next to it in the same location in the container. Um, I would also avoid tying um, anything directly to um, the plastic. I can um, foresee um, problems with certain plastics. And I think we have seen that a lot already. And then Laura asked a follow-up question. What about Teflon tape for tying labels? Huh. Hmm. I suppose, I mean, the Teflon, the Teflon's not, actually, I've seen Teflon pick up color from rubber materials hmm. now. And um, it can also pick, it can be stained by the plasticizer. But it's certainly going to be more, in, it's an inert ish material maybe if you didn't wrap it like a tape and maybe made it into a like a floss and used it as a tie I don't know Christina what do you think it's a it's, 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 a, it's a good point I think we um, more research needs to go into it to see if it's applicable for um, um, most of the plastics um, I don't have an immediate answer I think um, more research needs to go into that yeah, it sounds like that it's, at this point it's better to be on the safe side. And yeah. um, as Ellen re mentioned, you know, using redundant labels, labeling a couple of different ways and that don't touch the objects, having good photographs in a database to make sure it's really understood what object mm -hmm. is what. Um, great photographs, so great documentation is such a good idea. That was a really good idea. Yeah. That was a really good point. We just have a few more minutes, and I want to see if we can get to as many questions as we can, because we've had some good ones. Um, someone asked specifically about housing for dolls made of cellulose acetate, uh, butrate, and ethyl cellulose. Would you, um, you had given some recommendations earlier. Anything different for, for these that you can think of? Doll disease is, uh, doll disease is the concern that once a doll, uh, one of these plastic dolls is affected by an acid hydrolysis that it starts spreading across the doll. Um, and I would say you you would want to keep, I would store my degrading dolls separately from my non-degrading dolls. And I would rely very heavily on monitoring, keeping an eye on when degradation starts. I'm having a really good sniffer nose uh, to sense. And get those, I would get those pieces up, away from one another. Um, Christina? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. And I mean, you are much more experienced when it comes to um, cellulose um, acetate, um, but I totally agree. It makes, it makes sense to separate them. And um, what about objects that have plastic and metal components, like a piece of jewelry mm -hmm. or silverware that has a plastic handle? Uh, Keep it cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you, you, <laughs> you can try to wrap the, the metal component and um, well, protect it from uh, interaction with, with itself. Um, Wadida, what do you think? The conservagram that was recommended, um, which is a good, you know, it's got good general guidelines. I wouldn't adhere to it too um, uh, slavishly. But it talks about, I think, wrapping the uh, metal component yeah. in a uh, film and then leaving the plastic out to air. I would, I'd be interested to see what people's experience is with that and how well it works. Um, but beyond that, I'd try to keep the material, the object clean um, and cooler so that it's, when you drop the temperature, for every degree drop in temperature, you slow a chemical rea reaction. Uh, from happening. So when you can slow that speed of, say, acid evolution, you're less likely to have your metals corroding. Um, so I'd go with cold. And if anyone, I would love to hear if someone has tried the wrapping the metal component and to hear what, to hear what success they've had. OK. Um, I'd love to get just a few more questions. Are you all free for another about five minutes so we can keep going? Sure. OK. okay. Um, we, we had, I think, a really good question on, well, there's maybe this is two parts, but um, how would you go ahead and handle an object that you are already observing deterioration on? Um, I think maybe one of your photos may have shown a cotton glove, but is that lint problem going to be there? And then what about vinyl gloves or? Um, I would um, 
use nitrile gloves um, to begin with and really want to make sure that um, the skin is um, protected very well. If it's um, um, an extensive um, degradation, I might even um, consider to um, protect me from um, breathing it. It depends on the um, extent. But um, for sure, um, I want to make sure that um, there's no interaction, no no contact with my skin. And it depends on the degradation of um, 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 the polymer. But if you wear cotton gloves and you have some sticky components or liquid components on the surface of your work, you will for sure leave um, some fibers on the surface. So um, I would rather go for um, nitrile gloves than any um, than any um, cotton gloves. Right. And, and I would the blue one. Right? Yes, yeah, so nitrile the blue or sometimes purple. Yeah. There's market competition now in the color of nitrile gloves. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I asked. But the unpowdered version would be important because some of yeah. those gloves have powder and then you'd like to get the ones without powder. Um, there's some it depends on what you're trying to pick up, right? Plastics get to be a a catch all is a catch all term for a lot of materials and they may be in they've varying characteristics when they're stable and then they degrade in differing ways. So there are some objects like um, that are heavily plasticized that over time their painted surfaces might start disintegrating completely, it might liquefy. You don't want to be handling that at all. Yeah. Right? There's no glove that's going to be good for that. Um, and certainly with sticky objects, limiting the cotton gloves uh, is important. But a nitrile glove can take off a sticky, unstable surface as well. I would argue for limiting handling. Like look with your eyes, uh, not with your hands. You don't need to touch everything. Like, if you watch when people handle objects, it's great to see um, how many times people want to put their fingers on them. Try not to. And think about how many times you're going to have to turn that object over and interact with it. Try lifting it by a tray instead. If you've got it out on a table, put it down on a, um, if you put something down on the sheet of, say, Tyvek, you can then turn the sheet rather than having to pick up the object. Uh, because you don't want to be marring a surface. You don't want to be a destabilizing loose element. And you don't want to be putting, you don't want to be dirtying that object because they're so difficult to clean. Yeah, so I'm glad you mentioned Tyvek. So that you would line any kind of like a box or with Tyvek. I don't know any kind of box, but certainly a liner. Yeah. Um, a liner can be helpful. Something that's soft to prevent abrasion. Um, sticky objects are always the the caveat. Sticky objects stick to everything, but Tyvek wouldn't be a terrible choice. Um, so someone had a plastic suitcase, and they were con concerned about the interior. Um, should that suitcase be open or prop it open? It's got metal hinges. Sounds really complicated. <laughs> I have a plastic suitcase and I'm just reading the question. Does it smell? Well, let's, just, let's assume it doesn't. <laughs> Christina, what do you think? Mm, I could argue both ways. <laughs> um, it would be interesting to know um, does it mention what kind of plastic it is? No, right? Mm -mm. No. Uh, Depending on the age of the suitcase, it could be a number of things. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, I'd be a little concerned maybe about mold growing on the interior of it. That might be an argument for keeping it open. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. If it smells like vinegar, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. But if it's not smelling like anything, I don't know that it matters if you keep it open or shut. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And the metal hinges are somewhat corroded. That could just, uh, that could be from, it could be an acid effect, but it also could just be a factor of dealing with humidity. Suitcases tend to sit in humid attics and closets and places where they are likely to corrode. Yeah, Christine Shook has written in. She said it does smell. She's not sure exactly what type of plastic. It's from the mid-1950s. Yeah. Mm, don't know. We could see it going either way. Yeah. You're not going to destroy, you're not going to make a choice either way that it's going to seal the fate of that object, that yeah. it's going to, you know, it's going to be destroyed by either choice. Um, and then someone asked a question about South Asian lacquerware and if that fits into this 
sort of category of plastics. Um, someone was able to, Dee was able to share um, a name of a conservator that has experience with that type of material. Do you have any other experience or recommendations for that type? I don't. Yeah. Keep it out of the light. Um, keep it, you don't want, light damage is going to be a problem for lacquer. Uh, heat and extreme uh, conditions can be a problem as well. But light damage is a big problem, so keep it out of direct rays of light. Um, aim for low light conditions, no light in storage, uh, and keep the temperature well within the museum range. And then what if it, what if something is deteriorating to the point that, you know, it's off-gassing and, I mean, should something just be deaccessioned if it becomes so, un the plastic becomes so unstable? So I, did you, um, can I pull back the, I can't pull back my presentation. I showed a couple objects that were completely oh, disintegrated. Can you? Uh huh. I've shared. I'm sorry, everyone. I've shared the evaluation link. If you want to click on that link, um, or cut and paste it into your, I've put it in the chat as well. If you don't mind, if you have to leave, and ask also how people found us. But let me pull up this. I'm pulling up the slide. So here, if people can see that um, the object. Well, where's my pointer? OK, you can see the object I'm talking about. <laughs> it's a plane that's right in the middle of the, uh, towards the middle of the screen. That object was on exhibit with 160 others uh, at the National Air and Space Museum. And these started to explode on the wall. They look like they've been shot down. A number of these have been ex deaccessioned as study materials now, or are being, yeah, a number have been deaccessioned for the worst ones so that we can study them, because there really is no repairing them. But that's really, none of the, other, the, neither the coupon, the other plane, or the pair of goggles have been deaccessioned. De They're still accessioned by the museums. So I think that's a discussion one needs to have with one's curator. Um, it's going to depend on the value of the object. None of these are such a damage, a danger to the collections that they need to be excised from the building. Now we can I deal with them by storing them separately. I've Seeing some severe damages, uh, even in pretty stable materials like PMMA, uh, and uh, an artwork which was meant to be a light kinetic sculpture, so the um, um, the plexi was supposed to reflect the light while turning around, and the extent of crazing simply. Um, um, conflicted with the way the artwork was um, intended and therefore had to turn to a study collection too. Yeah, that's some, I think Dee mentioned that, that she had saved something even though it had severely deteriorated as at least a study piece. Mm -hmm. um, right, and sometimes I, they're useful for studying the technology. They're not necessarily needed for exhibit depending on the museum that you're in. At Smithsonian we have 137 million accessioned objects. There's certainly a tiny fraction of them is on exhibit. So having the object often still um, is still valuable for visiting researchers, for those of us who are on staff doing research. So there's a there is value to keeping objects even if they're not visually super presentable. Right. Well, I just want to um, ask one more question and then just uh, confirm something. But uh, one last question is: I know with the um, traffic cones and other construction materials. And what do you do if there is if there is dirt, either that an items become tacky over time and has attracted dirt or dust, or it came into the collection with dirt on it? What do you suggest one do with that? I would suggest that for a museum collection, um, it gets the answer is it's complicated. So what I would consider is bringing in a conservator. Um, to give a do a survey of that object or a survey of the collection, and then to prioritize uh, objects that should be considered for treatment down the road, and then prioritize resources to allocate resources to uh, the priority treatments. So I'd say I'd have a conservator do it. Yeah, no, no cleaning yourself. The soon as you well, the soon as you put it, you know, you can go wash a tra I can wash a traffic cone, but the second it becomes an artifact then the longevity, the whole lifespan, expected lifespan of the object has changed. And your interventions matter in a matter much more. So I would I'd contact a professional conservator right. for that. Yeah. And then I just wanted to confirm again, um, 
Dee had said she has a, um, a faux tortoiseshell hair comb that had actually liquefied. And she has been keeping it in, in, in a freezer storage. Um, but you had, I just want to reiterate, make sure I had it right, that for, for most, it depends, but in general, keeping things cool, 30 to 50 percent relative humidity, dust-free environment is usually, if it's a non-film material, usually the best way to go for a plastic artifact. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 You're safe with that. I mean, you might want to go into even more radical decisions with certain plastic, but generally speaking, this would be my advice, yeah. Right, and a hair comb, you know, if it's if it's a cellulose nitrate hair comb that's turning, liquefying or getting, I mean, there's a difference between it getting sticky and it liquefying, but if it's really on its way out, you're not going to stop that from happening. Uh, you might slow it a bit. So um, one consideration would be what is the future outlook for this object? Is it ever going to be exhibitable? Does it have research value? If it's in a freezer, is it going to be usable? Right. Um, I think once things go into cold storage, it's expensive to put things in cold storage. Um, and you do limit access to that object at that point. And I think with a lot of the cellulose nitrate material, once it's that far gone, um, if it's liquefied, then its demise seems maybe inevitable. Right. And so then just, again, would cool be 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit? I don't know. Oh, oh, I have Celsius. I have Celsius in my hat. <laughs> we know you want answers, but we don't have them for you. I mean, I would just say I mean, a range. It's just like the 30 to 50 per, it's percent 40, rate. 40 to 16 Celsius is usually recommended, which is probably, yeah. Yeah, OK. But about that range, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's what it's currently is. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah, I think we need more research in that area. So I'm not, and I get I get nervous putting out the Smithsonian said that we should store at da 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 da. The Smithsonian, this Smithsonian employee is saying that we don't know. Um, so uh, yeah, I hesitate to give numbers. Okay, so I think I think we're wrapping up today with caution and observation, observation, observation. Yep. Well, thank you so much, Christine and No Deal. For time today. We do need to wrap up and end the recording. Um, we will be posting this on the Connecting to Collections online community. Um, with your permission, we'd also love to post the PowerPoint and so people could have a, um, a better or a closer look at some of the forms you showed. And, um, and obviously, we have our discussion board on the online community. So if there are other specific questions, um, maybe we could filter those to you as well. Of course. Thank you so that much. That sounds great. Thank you okay. so much thank for, so having, much for us. having us. Fun. And thanks for all the good comments that we see running up the screen right now. Um, this has been great. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time today. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Okay.